Hello, welcome to this talk called Layer by Layer, Printing Your Own External Input Plugin for Telegraph. My name is Sebastian Spink, and I am a software engineer on the Data Acquisitions team. This is a team that helps develop the popular Telegraph project. Some background information, last year I chose as my quarantine craft to be 3D printing. It's been a really fun hobby that has kept me distracted the past year, and I've been able to create all sorts of random stuff like this gopher statue. The goal of this talk is to share with you how awesome external plugins are in Telegraph. External plugins are a powerful tool that can help you acquire data in unique ways that you might not have thought possible. I'll be spending this talk explaining how external plugins work and how you can begin using them. I'll be using an external plugin I've made that has helped me monitor my 3D printing hobby to guide this talk. There have already been a handful of cool external plugins created. For example, there is a plugin that gathers data from Twitter and another from alarms in AWS. I do believe there are a lot more creative projects that are waiting to be made of this feature in Telegraph, and I'm hoping by the end of this, you will have the knowledge you need to make a plugin for yourself. The structure of this talk is to start with the what and why of external plugins, then share the most basic example of an external plugin, and move into covering the more practical example, and then discuss what it looks like to use a language that is in Go to write a plugin. As you might already know, Telegraph is a plugin-driven agent for collecting and reporting metrics. There are hundreds of plugins already built into the official release of Telegraph you can use. These plugins allow you to gather and upload data to many popular tools. The common workflow for adding plugins to Telegraph is by forking the project in GitHub, including your new plugin, and then making a pull request, which will then require a review from a member on the team in order to be merged. Once the new plugin is within the master branch, it will be included in the next feature release. These plugins can be called internal plugins. What I'll be talking about today are external plugins. External plugins for Telegraph can be described as a program that lives outside of the Telegraph project, but is able to communicate with and be managed by Telegraph by an internal plugin called ExecD. There is an ExecD plugin for each type, input, processor, and output, which allows you to make an external plugin for any part of the Telegraph processing workflow. The ExecD plugin is able to communicate with an external program through standard out, and is able to read any of the supported data formats that Telegraph is able to parse, such as Influx Line Protocol, JSON, and more. There is a markdown file within the Telegraph repository that lists external plugins that have already been created. This is a great source to get a sense of what people are using external plugins for. While Telegraph offers a ton of plugins that cover many different use cases, it doesn't cover everything. And for those cases, that is where external plugins really shine. Not all plugins make sense to live inside of the Telegraph repository. For example, if you want an input plugin to gather data from a closed source application only used in your company, then external plugins are the way to go. Even if it would make sense to be an internal plugin in the future, starting it as an external plugin is a great way to immediately begin using it and testing it with the latest version of Telegraph without having to maintain a fork of the project. You won't have to wait for your plugin to be reviewed and released, which is great if you're still figuring it out. Another situation could be your plugin requires a dependency that doesn't make sense to be pulled into the Telegraph project. Maybe something that requires Seago to be enabled, for example or perhaps you are relying on a framework that only exists in another language. Because with external plugins, you aren't limited to writing your plugin in Go. You can write it in any language you wish. There is already an external plugin written in Python that you can take a look at. Here is a Bash script that serves as a great starting example of an external plugin. I've taken it directly from the readme and the input exec.d plugin, which contains two other examples I recommend you look at as well. This program is a simple Bash script that increments a counter in a loop. The loop is blocked by a read command, so it won't continue until it receives a new line signal from standard in. It also outputs the current counter value in influx line protocol to standard out, where the measurement is called counter bash and the counter value is set to the field labeled count. And just with these few lines of code, you already have an external input plugin. The execd input plugin is able to run the script and explicitly signal for more metrics using new line from standard in and then it is able to read and parse the resulting metric from standard out. Of course, this example isn't doing anything useful, but it already shows off one of the coolest features of external plugins. You now have an extension to Telegraph written in a completely different language. To use the Bash script example of Telegraph, you need to make a configuration file that registers the script of the input exec.d plugin. I've made a simple config file example to show you the components you need. In the section for inputs exec.d, there are three keys you should set. The first one is the command that will execute your external plugin, which is set as an array of strings. 
In this example, it is just the path of the script, but it is possible to add additional flags if your program requires it. Then there's the signal key, which needs to be set as standard in for the example script. But there are other options for this key. For example, you can set the signal to none, which will rely on the external plugin to output metrics on its own. There are other signals supported as well, but I won't be using them in this talk. The third key sets the data format the external plugin will output the metrics in. By default, it is set to influx, but you can set it to any data format Telegraph has a supported parser for, such as XML, JSON, or CSV. I should note there's another key you can set I happen to find here called restart delay. That will allow you to set how much time Telegraph should wait before trying to restart the command if there is an unexpected failure. This is defaulted to 10 seconds, and that should suffice for all the examples in this talk. The last piece of this config sets the output to standard out so we can see this plugin in action. As I execute Telegraph, you can see that it will start our script, which will start incrementing the counter, and it will start outputting the metrics to standard out. Now I would like to share with you a more practical example that I made, a external plugin to gather data from the API endpoints that Octoprint provides. If you've never heard of Octoprint, it is a great piece of software that you can put on a Raspberry Pi and it will let you control your 3D printer remotely. It also provides an API to get status information of a current print, such as the current temperature of the tools on the machine and find out if it's currently paused or actively printing. This is very useful with this hobby because your 3D printer could be in a completely different room and having to check on it periodically to see if it's done printing isn't feasible when some of these prints can take days. While Octoprint does have a web interface to display this information already, by capturing this information, you now have control to display it and store this information in more creative ways. Later in the presentation, I have a cool dashboard I made of Influx Data's cloud offering as an example what you could do with the data. My main motivation to look into another way to display the information on Octoprint is that the amount of remaining filament number was kind of hidden in the user interface, and I wanted to make it more obviously displayed because too many times have I run out of filament in the middle of a print without realizing it. This project example will hopefully help you get an idea of possibilities for external plugins, and that all you really need to get started is an access to an API to begin using Telegraph to gather data from it. While maybe other people might find this plugin useful, I don't think it makes sense to live inside of the main Telegraph project because it's a bit of a niche use case. I chose Go as a language to create the Octoprint plugin. So while there will be Go snippets in the following slides, I'm going to attempt not to focus too heavily on the Go syntax in case you aren't familiar with the language, but try to focus on the concepts and overall structure of an external plugin. That being said, there is a big advantage to using Go to write an external plugin because the Telegraph project provides a tool to help you quickly get started. It is called the Telegraph Exec D Go Shim, and it lets you write the external plugin just as if it was living inside the Telegraph project. You will get access to the same structures that internal plugins use, and you won't have to worry about writing the logic to interact with the Exec D plugin. Another advantage is that all the other plugins already written for Telegraph can be used as examples to help you along the way. Let's recap for just one moment to make sure I am clear on the terminology mentioned. When I'm talking about the Go Shim, this is a very isolated utility tool that can create external plugins. It exists to help you create external plugins written in Go and can help you migrate currently internal plugins to become external plugins with very little effort. While the Exacti plugin is an actual internal plugin living within the Telegraph project that exists to manage external plugins that are configured to run with Telegraph. Hopefully, that helps clarify any confusion between the two tools. They have completely separate jobs in this process. Let's look more into the Go Shim. Using the Go Shim is pretty straightforward. The README linked in the slide covers it in more detail, but I think highlighting the important steps might give you the context you need to start, because all you need is the main.go file dropped into your project. This will be the entry point for your external plugin. Then all you need to do is edit the file to register your plugin by importing the Go package containing the source code you've written for your plugin. Using the shim, it is recommended you have a separate project for each external plugin because the shim doesn't support handling multiple files. Once you have the Go shim in place, you can begin writing the functionality of your plugin. Each plugin has an interface it is required to conform to. For example, to make an input plugin, the gather method needs to be implemented, which takes an accumulator structure.
the accumulator exposes methods that will allow you to add metrics that will be processed and sent through the Telegraph's processing workflow. In the screenshot above, you can see the gather method used by the Octoprint plugin. I've removed some features to keep it simple. If you're new to Go, don't be concerned with the syntax, but just notice that on line 2 of screenshot number 2, the printer state information is being collected and that if there aren't any errors, it calls a method on the accumulator to save the state information. The state in this case is just a simple string that will describe what the printer is doing. It could say operational or printing or something else. The logic to gather state information isn't too important because behind the scenes it is just calling the Octoprint API to get the printer state data. In order to use the Octoprint API, we need the root URL and an API key to pass with the request to let Octoprint know we have the right permissions to make these requests. The execd goshim gives you the ability to find a Tomo configuration file just for your external plugin. It will look the same as the one you define for the main Telegraph configuration. All you have to do in your code is update the main plugin structure with the appropriate Tomo tags. I've included a screenshot of the Octoprint plugin struct to give you an idea of what I mean. It is important to note that the configuration for your external plugin has to be completely separate from the configuration file you use for Telegraph. This is to prevent Telegraph from accidentally reading the config, because it won't know what to do with it and fail to find the plugin. The config for your external plugin has to be set by passing a dash dash config flag to the external plugin binary. I have an example of this in the next slide. Configuring an external plugin made of the Goshim is very similar to the Bash script example shown earlier. As mentioned in the previous slide, you will have to compile your program to an executable binary and update the command to point to it. The Octoprint plugin requires a configuration file, so in the separate strings in the array, the dash dash config flag and the path to the plugin config are set. Also note that I've set the signal to none, opposed to the standard in like we did in the bash example. That is because with the exact goshim, it will output the metrics during a set interval, which is one second by default, but it can be configured by passing a pull underscore interval flag to the binary. All right, let's see what we have so far in action. I am going to execute the Octoprint plugin by itself because it will just output the metrics on its own to standard out. Once it's running, you'll notice that the values are set to operational. And once I confirm the filament I've loaded, then the values change to say starting, and then change the printing when the tools begin heating. And once I hit the pause button, it changes to pausing. Pretty straightforward, but we now are collecting useful data from Octoprint and outputting it in a format that the execd plugin can parse. So when I've been talking about 3D printing, I'm referring to something called FDM 3D printing. FDM stands for Fused Deposition Modeling, and it works by extruding melted plastic layer by layer to create an object. The plastic used in 3D printing is called filament, and it gets pushed out of something called a nozzle. The nozzle needs to be at a certain temperature, depending what kind of filament you're using. A common type is called PLA filament, and I've had good luck with the default setting of 200 Celsius for the nozzle. There is also the build plate that needs to be heated. This is where the plastic layer sits, and keeping it warm helps improve the adhesion of the plastic to the plate during a print. Otherwise, it is possible for the object to move out of place, and it will end up with a spaghetti mess of plastic. Keeping an eye on the temperature is important and is something else that can be easily retrieved from the Octoprint API. Following the same pattern as before to get the state data, we can get the temperature data and upload it to the accumulator. We need the current temperature and the target temperature for both tools. To continue extending the external plugin, we need to talk about a completely different kind of plugin. These plugins have nothing to do with Telegraph, but are plugins for Octoprint. Octoprint has a large selection of great plugins as well that can add cool new features to the software. I want to cover two plugins that will help expose interesting data that can be gathered in Telegraph's external plugin. The plugins I want to talk about next are called Display Layer Progress and Filament Manager. I've provided the links to each if you're interested in getting them yourself. Now let's take a closer look at each of these plugins and how they can be incorporated into the Telegraph external plugin. I have included a picture of the nozzle where the melted plastic is extruded from, and a picture of a completed object where you can see the lines of each layer. It can just be fun to know what layer your object is at, but it can also be useful. A useful situation I can think of is that if you use a model of 3D printer that only supports a single roll of filament at a time, such as the one I have, which is an Ender 3, but to get multiple colors in a single object, there is a trick that you can tell your printer to pause at a certain layer and switch out with a new color of filament to create cool effects. So it is useful to know what the layer that you're currently on, so you know that you have to switch filament soon. I haven't personally mastered this technique yet, but the results are neat. Display Layer Progress plugin luckily exposes a new REST API endpoint that can be called to get the current layer. Calling this endpoint, we receive a JSON payload with lots of good information we can use. The Octoprint framework I was using before to get the state and temperature doesn't support this plugin, 
but calling the API endpoint directly is quite easy to do with Go. While I am planning on using the other data points returned to keep it easy to understand, I am only showing a snippet of the JSON payload containing the current and total layer number. The external plugin now has a new method that directly calls the endpoint and then marshals the response to capture the current total layer using the structure I've shown on the screen. These values would be fun to watch change as the 3D printer is working. When you buy filament, it usually comes in a spool. I have a picture of one on the slide, and each spool contains about a thousand grams. Plenty of filament to print a lot of cool things, because we can set the info of each print to be only a small percentage so it doesn't take too much plastic. Whenever you prepare an object to be printed, it tells you how many grams of filament it will use. The spool I have has some useful marks on it showing a rough estimate of how many grams are left, which is nice but not very exact. And keeping track of the remaining grams manually is a pain. And while you can also weigh the spool to see how much is left, that's also tedious. With the Filament Manager plugin, it will help you keep track of the remaining filament of each print. You just need to manually register a spool, give it a descriptive name, and how much it currently weighs, and it will do the rest automatically. Unfortunately, the Filament Manager plugin doesn't expose a new API endpoint we can query to get the current list of filaments and their weights. The only way to get this information is to set up an external Postgres database for the Filament Manager to save the weight information in. I'm not going to show you how to set up a Postgres database, because there are plenty of good tutorials out there that already exist. I have a database set up on the Raspberry Pi where I have Octoprint running, but you can set up one wherever Octoprint can connect to it. Then I configured the Filament Manager plugin of the connection information needed to use an external database. The URL needs to be set, which contains the IP address the database is listening on, then the database name, and finally, a username and password that has access to read and write from the database. Now the Telegraph external plugin needs to be updated to be aware of the Filament Manager's database. We will need the same connection information the Filament Manager's plugin is using, so the configuration file needs to be able to set this information because it will be different between every user. Then I create an SQL query to gather the data I wanted from the database, which is just the currently selected spool information. I don't want all the spools registered, just the one that is being actively used in the current print. Now the external plugin can query the database to figure out how much filament has been used. Now let's see the Octoprint Telegraph plugin in action with a demo of my 3D printer printing something while it gathers data and outputs it to an Influx Data dashboard. First, I need to get a 3D object prepared for printing. I've made a very abstract looking tiger to be our test subject. I use an online program called Tinkercad to create it, which makes 3D modeling easy. To get it ready, I use a program called Cura that can slice an object and automatically add supports where there are any overhangs. It then gives you a preview of how much time the print will take and how many grams of filament it will use. This print will just take an hour and only 5 grams of filament, so it's pretty small. To capture the recording, I'm using another plugin for Octoprint called Octolapse that can take a screenshot of each layer and create a time lapse. It will automatically move the nozzle out of the way of the screenshot so it'll look like the print is rising from the bill plate. Alright, let's take a look at the time lapse of the print. And just like that, I have a cute plastic tiger. Well, almost. His chin did fall off during the print, but we'll pretend like that was intentional and it'll be a cool battle scar. There were 202 layers in this print, and the filament gauge dropped by 5, and the nozzle and build plate are cooling off. It might have been hard to see, but in the video, you might have noticed the temperature for the nozzle and the build plate rising and dropping a lot. But if you looked on the y-axis, it was only changing about a degree both ways, so not that big of a deal. The filament gauge also didn't change until the very end, which is a limitation in the Filament Manager plugin where it only updates after a print. Maybe a cool future change would be to have it output the change during a print. Here's an overview of all the components that work together during the time-lapse demo in order to display the dashboard. In the blue box, I put the Octoprint external plugin that gathers data from the Octoprint API, which is in the green box, as well from the Postgres database that the Filament Manager is outputting to. The external plugin sends this data to Telegraph, represented in the orange box, where the input exec D plugin parses the data from standard out, which then flows to the Influx database output plugin, which I had configured to upload to a bucket in a local running version of the Influx database, resulting in the dashboard you saw. The source code for the external Octoprint plugin for Telegraph is open source and available for you to do with whatever you want.
I'd be happy to accept any pull requests for new features you might have in mind, or you can simply use it as a starting point for another idea. I think it would be cool to see this plugin be used by someone who has multiple 3D printers and are all being monitored by Octoprint. Then you can put all the data into one dashboard, opposed to having to check multiple instances of Octoprint. At this point, you are probably set to start making your own plugin in Go. Just set up the Go shim and implement the appropriate interface, and you are ready. If you're planning on using Go as well, I recommend looking at the guidelines for each of the plugins in the Telegraph documentation. These guidelines have been written from the perspective of contributing an internal plugin, but they should still be useful when using the Go shim to create your external plugin. But what do you do if you want to write an external plugin in another language? We have looked at an external plugin written in Bash already, which gives a pretty good idea what the requirements are. But let's look at what the re-implementation of the Octopin plugin would look like in another language. Then we can see how a practical example plugin could look like if it wasn't written in Go. I am interested in trying out the language Rust, so let's use that. Here's an implementation of the Octoprint external plugin written in Rust. Please don't get hung up with the syntax, because what is important is to focus on the overall architecture of this simple program. This program behaves the same way as the original Go implementation, but without the nice features such as reading from an external config file. After writing this, I think I was able to boil down to four main parts to take note of when looking at implementing your own external plugin. First, you need some way to set any user-definable configuration. Second, you need a repeatable way to set metrics to ZECD. This implementation uses a time-based loop, but as we've seen, you can also wait for a new line signals from standard in. Third, you need to gather the data, and in this program, we are directly calling the REST API endpoint to get the 3D printer state. And finally, you need to output the data you've gathered in a supported data format. In this case, I've chosen InfluxDB line protocol again to match the Go implementation. With these parts implemented, you will have a working external plugin. Let's compile this program and see how it looks. As you saw, the terminal successfully outputted the state operational, and we now have a part of the Octoprint plugin working in Rust. Now it's just a matter of extending it with the other features we have covered. But what if you don't want to make an input plugin, but instead a output or processor? These types of plugins both have different configurations you need to set. An output plugin is nearly identical to the input plugin, but doesn't require a signal, as Telegraph will send all gathered information to it along with any other output plugins you've set. While processor plugins do have a structure requirement, where the program must accept InfluxLine protocol on standard in and output, the metrics and influx line protocol the standard out in order to properly communicate with the ExecT plugin. This requirement is in place to prevent losing any critical data, which could occur if the serialization and parsing step types aren't identical. Most of the external plugins that have been shared have been input, but there is an output and processor external plugin that have been created. Someone created an output external plugin to output to AWS's Kinesis service, although it seems a similar output plugin has been added to the internal project as well, but still labeled experimental. The processor plugin called GeoIP adds geolocation information based on the IP address and the input data. Both interesting and also serves as great examples if you want to do something similar. I provided the links each on the slide. And are you now excited to make an external plugin, but don't know what for? Then check out issues and pull requests within the Telegraph repository that are labeled with external plugin. These are great sources for ideas. These issues or pull requests have been marked by the team as good candidates for external plugins and are open to be taken on by anyone that is interested. As of writing this, there are a total of 24 to look through. I randomly grabbed three that seemed somewhat familiar to me and listed them on this slide as starting points. If they seem interesting to you, feel free to try implementing it yourself. If you run in any trouble, please ask any questions you might have in the Slack community channel. There are a lot of smart people who can help you there. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. I look forward to seeing any external plugins you might make. If you do make one, please share it by making a pull request to update the external plugins markdown document in the Telegraph project.